In the beginning, there was chaos. When the first Mario Maker got released, hundreds of thousands of people got their hands onto the game for the first time at the same time. And together we started to build up the gigantic online level pool that Super Mario Maker has today. The only problem? Very few people had an idea back then on how to build a good stage. The quality of the average Mario Maker level during the first couple of weeks was horrible. And now? Now Mario Maker 2 is just around the corner. The level pool is empty once again and we all get a second chance to do better this time. So as preparation for the upcoming sequel, we're going to take a look at how to design a good Mario level. We'll take a closer look at how the stages in traditional Mario games are structured. We'll try to replicate the structure by building our own small stage. And we will discuss tons of different facets of Mario levels. So you ready? Let's do this! Okay, so first things first, there is no universal truth to making good levels. There is not just one way to design a level so that it is worth a player's time. And to further complicate everything, there are many different types of levels that require different designs in order to work. A puzzle level is fundamentally different from a metroidvania level or a speedrun challenge stage. So this video is only going to focus on traditional Mario levels. But even if we only talk about traditional stages, there are several ways to design them and none of them is the right approach. So don't think about the stuff we're going to talk about today as some sort of the only way to design traditional stages, but more like one way to look at it. Something to keep in mind while building a level. Okay, so most traditional Mario levels consist of several parts. Each stage has a setting, it has a beginning, it has an end, it has a main element and supporting elements. It features secrets, it has a certain difficulty, platforming challenges and between those it has a lot of breathing room. So let's talk about all those different elements and how to put them to good use. First, let's talk about the setting. That one is quickly explained. Each stage features a certain coherent setting in which the level takes place. Sometimes it's flying airships, sometimes it's a dark cave in the desert, sometimes a lava filled castle or huge mushrooms in the sky. Just a simple theme that sets the mood, ties everything together and helps not to make it feel random. That's something we should always try to do when building a Mario Maker level. An example for such a theme would be an overgrown castle ruin or underground ice pyramids or maybe a stage where Mario has to play platform on top of crazy Monty Mole driven tanks. So that's about as complicated as Mario levels get, but there are actually other platformer games where the different levels not only have a different setting, but each level actually tells a small story. Tropical Freeze for example features the most famous example with the Ice Factory, through which our brave Kongs have to platform, while the evil level constantly produces ice cream in a fun but scientifically questionable way. One way to think about those stories that a level itself tells is to think about them like sentences. Like a normal non-story setting for a stage can be described with only a couple of words. A flooded cave, an overrun airship, a frozen mine and so on. While a setting that tells a small story requires a complete sentence to describe. For example, Mario has to find three keys to unlock the entrance to an ancient vault where not only unbelievable riches await him, but also a terrible turtle. Such a level would have a progression in its setting. First it's finding the vault, then searching for the keys to enter it and finally fighting off the terrible guardian inside the treasure room. Another example for a small stage that progresses in its setting would be Mario has to destroy a factory where Bowser creates terrible super goombas. In such a level Mario could first have to enter the factory, then he finds out what's going on inside, next he searches for a way to destroy the place and finally he has to make a quick escape while the whole stage collapses. It is generally a good idea to start by thinking about a setting for a stage, because once the setting is clear, it becomes much easier to make a lot of other decisions. For a small example stage, we'll go with the simple theme of a burning castle. Basically a traditional castle stage, but everything is themed around fire. Next, we have to decide onto which elements we want to use in our stage. So generally speaking, classic Mario levels often feature one main element and a couple of supporting elements. Those are used to build the actual platforming challenges in the stage. This stage, for example, uses those stone eye thingies, which are called stone eyes as its main element, meaning that most of the level's challenges are built around stone eyes. And then there are a couple of supporting elements that work well together with the main element of the stage. Here, for example, Waddlewicks, 
Koopas, Goombas, Piranha Plants and Sand Fountains. That's it, there aren't more elements in the level, only those 6 pieces are used to design the whole stage. Most traditional Mario levels work like this. Here for example, the main element are moving mushroom platforms with hungry piranha plants on top of them. And only Goombas are used to support this idea. And this stage uses Wigglers in poisonous swamp water as its main element with swinging mushroom platforms and Koopas to support it. So if we want to make a traditional Mario stage, it's a good idea to decide which main and supporting elements we want to use before we put down a single brick block. Focusing on only a couple of elements is a good idea for several reasons. It helps us to stay focused while building the level. It allows us to properly introduce all ideas. It reduces noise in the level and makes it easier to read for the player and find Finally, limiting ourselves to only a couple of core ideas often helps not to get overwhelmed by all the possibilities in Mario Maker and helps us to actually find out about all the amazing things possible by just mixing together a couple of elements. So let's talk about possible main elements. Those could be basically everything. It could be a single huge platform that carries Mario through the entire stage. It could be bullet blasters that periodically try to crush Mario. Goombas that carry cannons, simply moving platforms, drivable Monty Mole tanks or anything else we can come up with. So once we got a main element, we need to decide for a couple of supporting elements. So picking those is actually kind of tricky. It doesn't really matter what the main element of a stage is, anything we want to work with works. But once we decided for a main element, picking the right supporting elements becomes really important. The thing is, the supporting elements have to do a couple of jobs in the stage. First, we need them to bring variety to the challenges. Second, we need them to build our secrets. We need them to design small fun moments during briefing sections. If we want to include small puzzles in our stage, then they have to allow us to do that as well. And they have to fit thematically to our setting and our main element. Picking the correct supporting items really depends on what we're trying to do with with our setting and our main element. So for burning cast level, we're going with simple, ordinary, vertically moving platforms as the main element of the stage. We're going to use tracks on the side of the platforms to make their movement easier to read. And that's it, a super simple main element. Since those don't fit our theme of a burning castle well, we will use bullet bills that shoot hot lava bubbles, jet engines and standard lava bubbles to support our setting. In case you're unsure of what supporting element to pick, Koopas always work because Koopas are awesome. Their whole design is basically set up to support everything going on in traditional Mario stages. Give them wings and they can intercept each and every platforming challenge. Put some coins, bricks or enemies somewhere together with a Koopa and we've created a fun little moment. Force Mario to throw a shell at a hard to reach spot and we've created a small optional challenge. We can use their shells for puzzles or just put them on the ground as a small additional challenge. Koopas are really great at supporting basically everything, which is probably why Nintendo uses them so often in the mainline Mario games. Okay, so we got our main element, we know how to support it. What's next? Well next, let's talk about how to build the beginning of a level. We need to introduce at least our main element here. So it's probably not necessary to create a huge area dedicated to introducing the gameplay mechanic of platforms since, well, it's fair to assume that someone playing Mario Maker is familiar with how the main items work. If we have a bit of an unusual main element, however, like maybe a mole car, it's definitely a good idea to build a small safe area at the beginning where everyone is able to learn how it controls. Here's an example of how New Super Mario Bros. U introduces its elements. So this stage is built around only three elements. The main challenge here are the swinging platforms, which are supported by lava bubbles and dry bones. The dry bones and the swinging platforms are introduced Used right at the beginning of the stage. The swinging platform just safely swings above safe ground and features a question block with the stage's power-up for Mario. The dry bone comes directly afterwards. This little dead skeleton Koopa is placed in such a way that it is almost impossible to run into it by accident. This dry bone isn't meant to teach the player how dry bones work. That happened one castle earlier. This dry bone is just here to tell Mario to expect more dry bones in the stage. It's basically a walking signpost saying this stage features dead skeleton and turtles. And finally, the lava bubbles are introduced here. Those bubbles are actually placed so far down that they can't possibly hit Mario. Their job is once again only to indicate to Mario that later in the stage there will be lava bubbles that will actually try to murder him. 
Generally speaking, it's just good practice to show the player everything they'll have to survive once before it's actually used against them, just so that they know what to expect. So here's the introduction area for a small demonstration level. Here we have blasters at the bottom that can never reach our plumber, but tell him that the blasters in this stage are going to fire fireballs. Here's a moving platform, up there are the burners, not only informing Mario about their presence in the stage, but also featuring a small optional challenge for more skilled players. And here we have a lava bubble just jumping up and down in the wall, so that everyone knows to expect more of them later. Hmm. You know what? This area is getting a bit noisy and hard to read since we're introducing so much at once here. Let's introduce the bubbles a bit later instead. Hooray! Alright, so now we have our setting, our elements, everything is introduced. Next, it's time to build the actual challenges. So first things first. This may sound a bit counterintuitive, but the actual main platforming challenges only make out a quarter to a half of the stage in a traditional Mario level. The rest is breathing room. Let's quickly go over the fuzzy clifftop stage to show this. So this stage is built around fuzzies on tracks and those expanding block thingies. First the stage introduces both elements. This fuzzy just travels over our head to his final destination. Then there is a very short breathing section followed by the first mandatory challenge of the level. After this challenge we have quite some time to breathe before we're confronted with the second challenge. Once again it's platforming on platforms while dodging objectively perfect fuzzies. And then it's time for the checkpoint. Next we have a short relaxing section on one of those rotating wheels, followed by a short breather, the easiest challenge in the stage and another long breather. And then there is the final mandatory platforming challenge. If we take a look at how this level was structured then we should immediately see something interesting. So first there are only four mandatory main platforming challenges in the stage, two before and two after a checkpoint. In between in those challenges there is always breathing room that features different things from small fun moments to secrets to optional challenges. If we add the introduction and the end of the stage then the mandatory challenges only make up for a little less than half of the level. The rest of the stage isn't dedicated to straight platforming challenges. So this level was in the sixth world meaning it was closer to the end of the game. Earlier levels often only feature two mandatory platforming challenges, while the rest of the stage is dedicated to other things. That's one of the main things people sometimes disregard when they build a traditional Mario stage, although it is one of the very defining traits of Mario. Very, very few platformer games focus as strong on the downtime in between challenges as Mario does. So when we try to design a traditional stage, we should try to design at least half of the stage's breathing room. But what should these breathing areas contain? Well, that's where we put our secrets, puzzles, fun moments, exploration areas and optional challenges. Let's take a closer look at how the fuzzy cliff top designs those. First there is this small area where we can platform to that features a yum yum apple for Yoshi and a couple of coins. There is the optional challenge to reach the star coin, there is a fun moment where we throw a Koopa shell towards a couple of coins, there is this optional challenge where we can freeze this beautiful fuzzy and take a ride to collect a couple of coins. After the checkpoint there is this pipe which is easy to miss and can only be reached comfortably if we haven't lost Yoshi so far, this pipe takes us to a new optional challenge. The whole wheel thing is incredibly easy if we just make our way through, but the part is directly behind the checkpoint. So if we respawn and want to grab a new growth accelerating mushroom, then it provides a good small optional challenge, since it's really easy to lose this mushroom to the bottomless pit. As a side note, that's something almost all Mario stages do. Instead of directly handing out a new power up after a death, it's always tied to a small mini challenge where the new mushroom needs to be earned. The next section has this hard optional challenge built in where you need to jump off of this fuzzy in order to reach a 1-up. This part here is both an optional challenge and a fun moment. The challenge here is to reach the spot with Yoshi and the fun moment is that we can swallow an ice ball and freeze all the piranha plants at the top which makes them drop down onto their siblings at the bottom and opens up the path. And finally there is a hidden area close to the exit pipe. Hooray! Let's try to build similar breathing areas and optional challenges for a small example level. Here for example we can simply add a hard to reach question block with a 1-up mushroom for a bit of optional difficulty. This is what the mushroom regaining post checkpoint setup could look like. It's easy to accidentally throw this poor little mushroom into the lethal hot liquid here. And while we're at it why not use this to hide a small little secret area at the top as well. Here we use a camera position detector to trigger a power block and to shower Mario with tons of disgusting coins as soon as he finds this evil little secret room. 
This is what a small optional challenge somewhere in the level could look like. Here the reward would be a helpful fire flower. Here we have another small optional challenge. Here Mario has to race fast to reach this delicious one of mushroom before it falls into a fire trap and becomes unreachable. Finally, we could add a small section like this one, somewhere in the stage. Here P-Switch gets triggered off screen as soon as Mario enters this area, which allows him to collect tons of nasty coins and to climb upwards, where he is able to devour a delicious one of mushroom provided he is fast enough to reach it before the timer runs out and all the coins disappear again. Alright, so now we have tons of breathing areas in our level. Finally, let's talk about the actual challenging parts in between. So first, it's generally a good idea to vary these challenges and to try to mix the elements we use in the level in such a way that they always pose a slightly different challenge to Mario. And second, and much more difficult to achieve, we have to get the difficulty right. It's a good idea to think about how difficult we want the stage to be before we start to design it and then to try to end up building a stage around exactly this difficulty. The problem is, it's extremely difficult to build a stage around a certain level of difficulty. The best way to judge how difficult the level turned out to be is the clear rate, meaning the percentage of how many deaths it took someone on average to beat the level. If you are aiming to emulate about the same difficulty of a mid to late game Mario stage, then we should probably shoot for a clear rate somewhere between 30 to 12 percent. That would mean that on average it takes a player 3 to 8 lives to beat the stage once. Higher skilled players probably lose less lives, lesser skilled players probably more, but on average something between 3 and 8 lives. I'm totally guessing here, but I'd say that sounds about right for an official Mario level. So how do we make sure that we end up with a level with a clear rate between 30 to 12 percent? Well, to be honest, there's pretty much no way to ensure this beforehand. The best way would be to grab a couple of people of different skill levels and have them play the level. In other words, play testing it before releasing it, so that we're actually able to see how people who didn't design the stage play it, how often and where they die, and to then adapt all the areas that ended up being too difficult. If you have access to a couple of people that are willing to play test the level for you, definitely do that. But most people probably won't be able to do proper playtesting with many different people before uploading a stage. And then it just kind of comes down to experience. The best way to approach this is by designing a stage with a goal of a specific clear rate, then to hop into the death analysis mode and to find out where we judge the difficulty wrong and then we'll learn from it for the next time. Think about it more like a challenge. Like, is it possible to build a Mario Maker level that has an exact clear rate of 20.0%? One thing to keep in mind when trying to reach a certain clear rate is that we basically always judge our courses to be easier than they actually are. That's for two reasons. First, we already know the level when we play it for the very first time, since we put everything there, while a new player has no idea about the level layout. And second, it's really easy to underestimate how much we gradually master our own stage while playtesting it. Whenever we put a couple of new elements down, we platform past them a couple of times, which means when the level is finished and we actually start to upload it, we probably have beaten most parts parts of the stage already dozens of times individually, which makes the level appear way easier to us than it actually is. So when in doubt, I'd always recommend to reduce the difficulty when going for a traditional stage. Also, there are those really strange moments when building a stage no idea how to describe them. Like when we put down a new challenge and then we playtest it and we die over and over again until it suddenly clicks and from then on we never die again at this part. No idea if you guys know what I mean, but if you know what I mean, those sections basically always end up being too hard. That's when we simply got a challenge burned into our muscle memory and such parts basically always end up being frustrating to newcomers. Actually, now that I come to think about it, we actually had such a part earlier when we took a look at the optional Fireflower challenge. The free chat engines here are set up in a horrible way that will probably lead to a lot of frustration. That's something we should probably make a bit easier. Okay, so finally, how does a traditional Mario stage end? Usually with two things. First, an echo of the main element of the stage. The same way the main element gets introduced at the beginning of a level, it gets a goodbye at the end. Not as a challenge, but as a reminder of all the challenges that the player mastered up until this point. And second, there is usually a small optional challenge to hit the top of the flagpole. Alright, so now we hopefully have a stage that features a setting, main elements, supporting elements, challenges built around a specific difficulty, lots of breathing room filled with fun little distractions, a beginning and an end. Ladies and gentlemen, we've created a unique and hopefully playable level. 
Hooray! There's just one final thing left to do for us, and that is to playtest the stage. So it's a good idea to play the level at least three times before we finally upload it. Once normally, just to ensure that everything works as intended. Once we should speedrun through, mainly to find out if there are small annoyances for speedrunners in our stage. We actually have an example for this in the beginning area of our fire castle. This platform cycles in such a way that it blocks the path forward when running fast. There's no reason for the platform not to start traveling into the other direction first, which makes the beginning a lot more satisfying to speedrun through. When speedrunning through the stage, we're basically looking for tiny improvements like that, stuff that makes the level more enjoyable when played fast. And finally, and most annoyingly, it's a good idea to try to beat our stage again without pressing the run button. The reason for this is simply to get a playthrough of the stage without all the muscle memory we build up while playtesting, which should help us to find hiccups in the difficulty. And then we upload the stage and hopefully earn a lot of hoorays and very few boos. Hooray! Okay, so before we end this little video, just one more thing for all you Discord users out there. Everyone's favorite crow, Psycro, went through the trouble of setting up a beautiful little Mario Maker 2 Discord server. The server is focused around building crazy contraptions, fury crafting, amazing Mario Maker tech, flaming hammer bros, discovering glitches and talking about things in general that have the potential to make Mario's life a living hell. There are a lot of legendary Mario Maker creators in the channel and it's a really cool place to discuss all the weirder mechanics in Mario Maker. So for anyone who is interested in joining a server that focuses on tearing apart Mario Maker 2 as soon as it gets released, there is a link to the server in the description. And with that being said, thanks for watching this little video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to leave me a thumbs up and maybe feel especially well sign today and want to hit the subscribe button as well. I hope that all of you have a wonderful day and to see you soon. Goodbye!